2004. I'm interviewing William Huebner from Avon. Interviewer is Eileen Hurst Downey from Central Connecticut State University. Bill, will you tell me your full name, your birth date, and your current address? Uh, William J. Huebner, 1925, which was a very good year. What uh, war were you in and what branch of the service? Uh, World War II, U.S. Army, and uh, Korea, U.S. Army. And what was your rank? Uh, Corporal of World War II and Staff Sergeant in Korea. Going back to when you first joined the Army, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted, 1943. Remember the month? March. Where were you living at the time? Watertown, Massachusetts. When you were drafted in the Army, did you have thoughts of joining another branch of the service or you were okay with the Army? No, uh, I originally uh, signed up for the U.S. Air Corps when I was 17. Uh, at that time, they were taking uh, uh, high school seniors at uh, age 17 and then bringing them in to the Air Force for cadet training when, t when they turned 18. And that's just how I got in it. So did you join, were you 17 years old at the time? I was 17, and uh, I went into the U.S. Air Corps, or uh, the Army Air Corps, there wasn't any United States Air Force, Army Air Corps, and I was sent to um, at Miami Beach for basic training and then Gulfport, Mississippi uh, for flight training, and I washed out because my eyes went bad from 2020 to 2030. And uh, they wanted to send me to gunnery school, but I was too tall. I was six foot three. And then they said they're going to make me an aircraft mechanic, and I didn't care for that. And uh, at that time, you could volunteer for the infantry or the paratroopers, and I volunteered uh, for the infantry. And I was, the next day I was put on a train out to San Francisco and heading for New Guinea. Wow. When you uh, first joined the Army Air Corps and went to Miami, did you do your basic training in Miami? Yes. And how long was that? Uh, about a month, two months. What was the basic training like in Miami? Oh, uh, marching, uh, rifle, uh, uh, sidearm, firing, that's about it. And then from Miami you went to Gulfport Field, Mississippi. Gulfport? Gulfport, Mississippi. And what kind of training did they do there? Uh, the, uh, I think of the old Piper aircraft and uh, Stearman 17s, biplanes, and uh, that only lasted about two months until they caught up with my eyes and I got taken out of flight training. Did you actually do any training in aircraft before? Yes. About your eyes. Yes. Did you have bad vision before you went in, or no? Was it it, it, uh, it uh, seems uh, overnight it went from 2020 to 2030, and I just couldn't read the uh, 2020 line on the chart, and that's how they caught it. Okay. I just woke up one morning and I couldn't see the leaves on the tree. Wow. Was that a disappointment for you? Oh yes, very much so. Uh, matter of fact, I went to the nearest store and bought the. Uh, Ten cans of carrot juice. They said carrot juice would improve your eyesight. I, I drank the damn stuff and it tasted lousy, but it didn't help the eyesight. So then, th then you joined the infantry. Yes. And where did you go from there? Uh, Camp Stoneham, California. Camp Stoneham. Oh no, wait a minute. Uh, uh, Camp Kearns, in Utah. And you have more training there. More training, and we actually got mountain training. Uh, and cold weather training. And we thought we were going to get ready to go to Italy or some other place where there's mountains and snow. But, uh, and we're issued heavy clothing. And uh, then all of a sudden, overnight, we had to get on a trucks or trains and get to uh, Frisco. And we were shipped out to the South Pacific. How much notice did you have? Uh, overnight? Overnight, yeah. Did you know it's 
time where you were going? No. So then they put you on ships in San Francisco? Yeah, it was, uh, the ship was the motor ship Swatterdyke. It was a Dutch cargo vessel, carried about 200 men. Now we were all replacements, infantry replacements, riflemen. And uh, oh, about seven days out, we were in a convoy and uh, at night we were zigzagging and uh, we were hit by another American ship uh, broadside and we had an abandoned ship. Uh, the ship didn't sink but they put us in the water on rafts and when the dawn came up and uh, we could see the ship that hit us because their bow, their bow was caved in and our ship would, had a big hole in the middle. So uh, we got back on that ship, it was listing badly, and uh, it was towed actually to uh, Espirito Santo in the New Hebrides Island. Now, Espirito Santo was uh, a beautiful island, French island, and uh, they made the movie South Pacific on it, and uh, it was a, a most wonderful island. And we stayed there until no another ship came and we boarded that and ended up in the invasion of New Guinea, British New Guinea. Do you remember how long it took to cross to, get to New Guinea from when you left San Francisco? Oh, because we had to go onto the island, uh, I think we, were, we lost about two months. You were two months at getting the boat fixed? Or yeah. Another boat? Holy cow. It must have been pretty scary when you were a young guy and you were just on the boat and you get crashed. When you're young, nothing scares, scares you. Do you remember any of your instructors from basic training? No, they were, they were all sergeants and they're all southern boys. And uh, <clears throat> I remember the first time we lined up for a roll call, this uh, a big old southern sergeant came and he says, now I, I want you all to help me. And we figured help me, help, 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 you know. Uh, but he meant I want you all to help me. So I, we had to learn the southern language, being Yankees from Massachusetts. Do you remember any memorable experiences from basic training at either Miami, Mississippi, or Utah? Miami was wonderful. Uh, we were living in a big luxury hotel and uh, ate in the dining room. And Mississippi, I think, I remember about Mississippi is they, in the barracks, they burnt soft coal. And it's all you could smell all day long is this soft coal uh, burning. And of course, out in Utah, it was cold. And we we're up in the mountains and uh, I must say one thing, uh, I was there on Thanksgiving Day and uh, we were invited for Thanksgiving dinner, that's three of us, uh, by a Mormon family and they put on such a tremendous fee for us that I'll never forget it. Uh, I'm not a Mormon, but I'll never forget the hospitality of the Mormon people. Where did you exactly, did you land in New Guinea? Do you remember the landing? Yeah, uh, Finchhaven. Finchhaven was a, um, a coconut plantation uh, in British New Guinea. And it was owned by, for hundreds of years, palm olive peat. And that's, they used to make palm olive soap. And they used the coconut oil to make the soap. Uh, the, 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 uh, the the coconut plantations were about, oh, maybe a hundred square miles up and down the coast. But beyond that was the jungle and the, the, that's where the Japanese were. We started going after the Japs, but we're losing too many men. And MacArthur made a decision. He said, uh, contain them. Don't go after them. Just keep them in there. Let them get hungry and starve, and which we did until we were taken over by another unit to re contain them in the jungles. Do you remember what the date was when you, were, when you arrived in New Guinea? You were still in 1943? Uh, in 43, late 43, yes. And what was your specific job? I was a rifleman. 
What are the duties of a rifleman? What, kind of, what would your day be like? To shoot a rifle at the, at the enemy. <laughs> uh, I, uh, we were given a, a Garand rifle and uh, we were trained in it. And we were also trained in the Thompson submachine gun and the M1A1 carbine. But basically, I was a rifleman. What was barracks life like? Where? In New Guinea. There Where? wasn't any. Did you sleep in a tent? You know, on the ground. Did you have a camp, or were you constantly on the move in a different place? Oh, we were constantly on the move. So there was no base camp where you actually ever no. slept for any length of time? No. We even had uh, kitchens that followed us, uh, portable kitchens, uh, if you want to call them kitchens. It was just a place to heat up the sea rations. How many casualties were there in your unit? Well, when I replaced them, uh, they had quite a, quite a few casualties because they went after the Japanese. And the Japanese can hide in the jungle and, and one man can pick off three or four men. And that's why it was useless to go after him in the jungle because we couldn't win. And MacArthur says, leave him alone, contain him, let him get hungry. And uh, I ended up being a corporal, and uh, so I had a squad and only lost one man because I made sure that they uh, didn't go after the Japanese. How many men in a squad? At that time, the old squad was uh, about 12 men. Were you ever a prisoner of war? No. Can you remember any memorable experiences on New Guinea? <sighs> well, aside from being harassed by Japanese uh, mortar and uh, rifle fire, um, uh, we got hit in the swamps of New Guinea with uh, leeches. Uh, <clears throat> we'd have to wade through the swamps, and um, maybe 12 hours after that, when we got through with our mission, uh, our boots uh, were, were all warm. We took them off, and the blood came out of them. Well, these leeches dropped off the trees or from the water, went into our boot. And of course, little tiny things. But when they, when they get through sucking all your blood, they, they blow up like a, as big as a walnut. And uh, they got in their boots, and then we squashed them after they were full, and we were walking around our own blood. And that's that's one way I got uh, what they call dengue fever, uh, from uh, from uh, leeches. And they used to drop off the trees down your back. And uh, it's very hard to take them off. You can't scrape them off with a knife because it leaves their fangs in your skin. And then the infections go in through the fangs. You gotta burn them off with a cigarette butt. Put a cigarette butt on the end of, uh, at their head and they with withdraw their fangs. Uh, either that or you gotta put alcohol, but we didn't have any alcohol. But whatever alcohol was available, we drank. Well, so you had dengue fever while you were over there? Yes, and I also had malaria. Did that, did you, did you stay on duty or did you spend time in a hospital over there? Uh, no, <coughs> quite a few of us had malaria and uh, what they did, we had to take Atabrid tablets and uh, that held down the malaria uh, so you could function. Some people had to go to a hospital. These hospitals were just big, long tents. And um, those that didn't take Adabrin, they got the, the sweats and the shakes, uh, the sweats and the chills from malaria. Uh, but they, they could face a court martial if they didn't take their Adabrin tablets. And one thing about Adabrin, you knew if you were taking them or not taking them because it turned you yellow. And underneath there, all yellow, under your armpits, yellow. And uh, because Atterburn was yellow anyway. How do you spell it? A T A B R I N E. It's a replacement, a synthetic replacement for quinine. The Americans lost all their sources of quinine when the uh, Japanese took over Borneo, Sumatra, and the other areas. So 
So they, they, they came up with this synthetic uh, ad, uh, quinine called Adabrin. And it worked. How sick were you from the dengue fever? Well, no, I think I only lost, uh, pulled out of the line for maybe one or two days maximum. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Oh, I got to, uh, what, in New Guinea? Yeah. Well, I qualified for the Asiatic Pacific uh, medal with uh, one battle star at that time. Uh, we moved from British New Guinea up to Dutch New Guinea, and that was Hollandia. And uh, it was an old mining town in uh, New Guinea. New Guinea is the second largest island in the world, Greenland being the largest island. So uh, New Guinea was divided between the British and the Dutch. And uh, Hollandia was a mining uh, community for the Dutch, also gold mining. And uh, we uh, landed short of Hollandia, went up and took, took the main town, but primarily the airstrips. The Japanese had about oh, 10 airstrips in and around Hollandia. And our job was to destroy, uh, get rid of them and destroy whatever we could destroy. In case we had to leave, they couldn't have a their gasoline storage depots, uh, their uh, ammunition depots, uh, food depots. So uh, uh, it, was a, it was a pretty tough battle for New Guinea for a while. And uh, my unit wasn't the only one involved in it. Uh, the 11th Airborne Division uh, had one of the first parachute jumps on New Guinea. What was your unit? The 595th Signal Aircraft Warning Battalion. And that was a rather unique organization. It was only a battalion. Uh, my job was to provide security for these um, radar technicians. This is um, portable radar. And uh, they would go in onto small islands, sometimes without any Japanese on them, and set up this portable radar to cover areas that the big radar cannot cover. Because the Japanese used to go on, a, on the deck between the islands, and the big radar couldn't pick them up, and all of a sudden, you had fighters on top of you. So with this portable radar, the, um, the signal aircraft warning battalion would pick them up, pick them up about 20 miles away, and radio back that they're coming in through the, these blind spots, uh, and it worked. Uh, the uh, anti-aircraft people had uh, at least uh, 10, 20 minutes to get ready for the uh, arrival of these uh, aircraft. Usually there were single engine uh, fighters that uh, they were out trying to destroy our ammunition dumps, our food dumps, gasoline dumps, and ships. Uh, and my job, of course, provides security. Uh, we did land on other islands. Uh, you know, there's thousands of islands in the South Pacific. We landed on some islands and nobody was there. So we set up. Other times, it was a Japanese weather station. And we landed, and then we had to go and eliminate those men operating that weather station. Uh, and uh, do, you know, do it quietly uh, so they couldn't radio that their station was being intercepted. And other times, uh, ran into a company or a battalion of Japanese. And once we got on there, we had to pull back. We did it in rubber boats. And we usually did it at night. But once they got set up, I established a perimeter around the men operating this ra these radar units, these small radar units. And uh, my job was not to shoot, but to protect them and uh, try to keep it as quiet as possible. If we were discovered, we had a fight. But... Uh, were you ever discovered? Yeah, we were discovered. And we had to, well, we had to destroy the equipment and then 
raced back to the uh, place we landed, and we had little rubber boats get on there and, and uh, go back out to sea. Uh, but we had a radio, and there were boats out there to pick us up. When you'd go on these missions to be security, how big of a group of men would you take? Just your 12-man squad? Or oh, the 12-man squad. That was only uh, four riflemen. Uh, the rest were ra uh, radar technicians. So there was only four of you that were protecting that? Yeah, and that's all they needed. Because again, I say it wasn't our job to, to engage in combat. Okay. It's to avoid it, to, to get there quietly and let nobody know we're there. Did you get any other medals during World War II? Yeah, yeah Philippine Liberation. Uh, we got one from off of uh, British New Guinea and uh, metal and uh, Dutch uh, government, the uh, Dutch government in Holland uh, for the liberation of their part of New Guinea. And uh, I think that was about it. Where did you go from Dutch New Guinea? That's the Biak Island. Biak? B-I-A-K. That was a, a big island between uh, the top of New Guinea and the bottom of uh, Borneo. And um, we set up our units uh, facing Borneo because the Japanese had airfields on Borneo. And we had to give advance warning to the troops that were hitting the bottom of Biak Island. And um, it was, um, well, it was about a two, two month operation. Uh, and we were successful. We, uh, we got a lot of the incoming aircraft and uh, alerted the uh, troops uh, that uh, the aircraft were coming after them and uh, they could take uh, preventive measures. It must be 1944 by now? Yes. go after Biak Island? <coughs> uh, Owe Island, O-W-I. Uh, it's a very small island, oh, about 20 miles off Biak Island. And uh, we were going to set up a unit, uh, a, a portable radar unit, to cover a certain dead spot uh, on the approach to Biak. And um, we landed on Oe. Oe was only, I think it was two miles long, one mile wide. It was supposed to be deserted. And we went in there, what they call standing up. Well, <laughs> there was about, about 30 Japanese on the island. Most of them were mechanics, because there's one airstrip on Oe Island. And most of the Japanese were mechanics, aircraft mechanics. And there were a few that were trained in in uh, the use of rifles, machine guns. And uh, all of a sudden, we've got all this machine gun fire, and we say, you know, where the hell are these people coming from? And uh, the guy said, well, they're only supposed to be mechanics. And he said, mechanics aren't supposed to shoot like that. But uh, we found out they did, so we had to call in support. And we actually called in air, air support on us to, to bomb these positions. And uh, we finally got rid of them. It was a big surprise to us. Where did you go from Owe Island? Owe Island we staged and for the invasion of the Philippines. Uh, the first was the Lady Island. We weren't involved in that. Uh, ours was uh, uh, Luzon Island, the major island in the Philippines. And we landed in the Gulf of Lagan, which was uh, oh, about 100, 200 miles above Manila. And we went in a place called Dagupan, and we staged there and then went out to set up our units uh, in the northern part of the Philip of Luzon Island because the Japanese had aircraft coming from Formosa to, uh, to, to, to bomb the uh, American ships uh, that were starting to land troops. Now, a lot of the uh, Formosan aircraft were coming on the deck. 
the big radar couldn't pick them up. So we, our unit, could pick them up when, even when they were skimming the water, we could pick them up. And I, mean, I couldn't, but the technicians could. And um, it was very, very active at that time. And we went all the way up to northern Luzon, uh, northern Luzon setting up these units because there are a lot of small islands in between. And it's surprising, the Japanese may have an airstrip maybe 5,000 feet long, and they'd have two or three fighters on it. They were undocumented. We didn't know they were there until they took off, well camouflaged too. And uh, but the trouble is they were running out of gasoline. Uh, but they, uh, when they had enough gas, they came after us. So we ended up in the northern part of Luzon, Luzon Island. And uh, then we went down south again. I don't know why. I think we were supposed to invade Formosa, and which was a major Japanese base, which is now Taiwan. And uh, uh, we were going down to uh, Manila, which was, was just about taken by the American forces, except for the walled city of uh, Manila, an old Spanish historic area, and the Japanese wouldn't surrender. And the Americans had to clobber it with artillery and everything else to get them out. They wouldn't come out. They, had to, they died in there. But I, I saw the ja the, what the Japanese did to the, the Filipino people in, the, in Manila. They killed them. They slaughtered them. They were mad at them. And they just, just went on a rampage. And these uh, dead civilians were lying in the street all over while the war was going on. And uh, they weren't killed by the Americans. They were killed by the Japanese. Because the, the, the Philippines, Filipinos were helping the Americans. Throughout the war, they were the Filipino guerrillas, but it was a was a was a hell of a slaughter. After Manila, where did you go? Home sweet home. You remember the date? Or what month and year? Well, I was released from active duty on December fifth. 1945. It took us two months to, on the ship again. Uh, Did you get home? Yeah. Well, we got to landed at uh, San Francisco and then got on a train uh, across the United States. And that was a long trip, too. And we ended up at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. While you were overseas during the war, how did you stay in touch with family? V-mail. V-mail? Yeah. Can you explain what that was? Uh, V-mail, you write a letter and the Army takes a photograph of it, might put it on microfilm, and ship it over, and then they reproduce it into a, a letter. They put it on a little microfilm, the letter. So they could handle a lot of uh, V-mail. It must have taken quite a while for you to correspond. You send one home and did the letters come back the same way? No, the letters came back uh, as regular, regular mail. mail. Yeah. What was the food like while you were overseas? <laughs> Rotten. We uh, got to on the move all the time, so when we weren't on the move, the, the, uh, because we were only a battalion, we'd be assigned to eat with some regiment, and uh, who, which was uh, at rest. And they had these portable kitchens, and so you got oh, hot corned beef, uh, hash, uh, powdered eggs, powdered milk, uh, powdered lemon juice, lemonade. Uh, and sometimes we get what they call bully beef, the Australian beef. And uh, it was tough. Of course, if you boil the hell out of it, it softens it up. But it was meat. So uh, uh, that was it. Except for when we were on, on, a, on an operation, we didn't have anything. We had K rations, C rations or K rations. And uh, they caught field rations. Uh, 
It was just emergency rations to keep you alive. Did you feel any pressure or stress while you were overseas doing your job? No. Did you do anything special for good luck? Do what? Good luck. You know, some guys have rabbit foot. No, oh, no. <laughs> no. Did you get to see any parts of the countries uh, while you were overseas? Did you get to go anywhere else and visit anything? Do any Visiting. I was. I went where I was told to go. <laughs> I didn't. Visit. I didn't visit any place. But every place that you went, you guys were walking to get there. Yeah. All right. And for the record, Bill does have photographs that will be included. Do you remember any of your fellow soldiers or officers? From World War II? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there was a, from the, there was a battalion sergeant major, his name was Saunders, and he was from Texas. He was a good man, a good master sergeant. And, uh, oh, I worked under a, a staff sergeant, uh, I forget his name now. Uh, they're all older, I don't I was young. And they were all older, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, we were a very small unit, so. Your squad was only 12. How big would a battalion be? How many men are in a battalion? Oh, a battalion's got uh, uh, 1,500 men. A thousand to 1,500. Do you recall the day your service ended from World War II? Yeah, December 5th, 1945. What did it feel like getting out of the service? I didn't get out of the service. I signed up as in the reserves. Why did you do that? Well, they said to keep your rank and uh, stay in long enough to get a pension. What was your rank at that time? Corporal. So when you were in the reserves, you could still go home and the, uh, do weekend? And I went, I got... I got released from active duty and, and uh, accepted in, in the reserves, Army Reserves. And I went home and I went to college. Where did you go to college? Suffolk University, Boston, Massachusetts. What university? Suffolk University, a great university. The front door of the university was the, was the back door of the state capitol. The back door of the university was the back door of the old Howard Burlesque at Scully Square. So we were in class, we could, in the summer, the windows were open, we could hear the, uh, the chorus girls doing their bumps and grinds uh, rehearsals. And what degree did you get from the university? I didn't get any. I, uh, I took a job as uh, running a weekly newspaper in Harwich, Massachusetts, weekly newspaper. Why did I do this? I met a guy, Senator Harry Alboro, state senator, and I was in the College of Journalism for the Suffolk University. And he stopped by one time and he says, uh, so young man, I, got a, I own a newspaper down in Cape Cod. How'd you like to run it for me? And I said, sure, My summer vacation, I'll do it. And how much? He said, well, I can't pay you much. He says, but I'll give you a room and board which was good. We later found out he owned a restaurant down there called the Red Sail Restaurant, so that's where we ate. And he owned the, the, the barn where the parsonage, congregational parsonage, stored their equipment, but there was a, a, a room above the barn and he let us sleep up there on cots. But we're, again, we're young. So. So you didn't go back to school in the fall? You oh, yeah, I went back to school, and then he says, uh, I'm going to keep the paper going all year long. Harwich Independent. Harwich, Cape Cod is a very small town. What was the name of the paper? Harwich Independent. So he says, why don't you come down here for the winter and run it and uh, see what it can do. You know, I was thinking, well, maybe I can buy the place. And uh, so I worked there in the winter. Uh, the one thing about that newspaper, we had a circulation of 500 in the winter. 
5,000 in the summer because all the summer residents would pick it up at the stores that had subscriptions and stuff. And the advertising came from, oh, like the A&P and the First National, it was stores and the auto dealerships, and uh, the playhouses and the Cape. Uh, one of my most memorable occasions on the Cape was uh, we used to get free passes to the uh, summer playhouses. Uh, plus, they used to have a cocktail hour, a little food and everything else, so we always took advantage of it. But I interviewed uh, Edward Everett Horton. Uh, the older people will know who he was. Very nice guy, a veteran actor. And uh, he invited me to uh, backstage and uh, showed me how the actors make up and uh, how they learn their lines and everything else. He was a very nice man. I never forgot it. And uh, that was a, quite an experience to meet a person like him. Did you, when you went to Suffolk University, was, did, was that supported by the GI Bill? Yes. So uh, how did you end up staying on the newspaper? You never went back to school after that? No, I... Uh, I, uh, I, I enjoyed it, and I, I jacked up the circulation, the revenue, and everything down there. And I, was, I actually took two of my friends from the university to work with me, and they were getting dissatisfied. So I had a staff of two men, and they sold advertising, did stories, and, uh, and hustle circulation. And I don't mean over-the-counter circulation, a year-round circulation. And uh, we did pretty well on it. One guy left for, uh, eventually ended up in Indiana working, and uh, the other one uh, was, uh, became an actor. Uh, but we had a great grand time down there, the three of us. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the names were Eddie Pow uh, Richard Powers, Dick Powers. Uh, and I played the accordion, and he played the guitar. And then we used to go to amateur hours down the Cape during the summer. You win prizes. We win $5, $10, and everything else. Uh, depends on how much the audience would applaud. But the third uh, uh, member was uh, Eddie Pearl. He was a handsome kid, uh, black Irish, black Irish eyes. And he had a voice that would melt your heart. He was a real Irish tenor. And we used to go in. And we'd win all the time. We'd get five dollars, ten, fifteen dollars at these amateur nights because of his singing. And I was a lousy accordion player, but I could I could play my Wild Irish Rose. I'll take it home again, Kathleen. And, uh, but he he used to make it. He he was a he was a hell of a singer. And I, I guess he eventually became some type of a professional singer after a while. Did you stay in touch with any soldiers that you knew from World War II after the war? No. All right, now I understand you were also in Korea, so how'd you go from running a newspaper to getting in Korea? I got a letter, a telegram from the government and said, you ought to report to the uh, Army base for a routine physical. <laughs> so I re what, the year? Oh, it was 1950, right after the Korean War started. So I reported to the Boston Army base, got my physical, and I said, all right, you're being recalled. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're going to go uh, to Korea because what they were taking were uh, infantry, armored, and artillery, because that's what they needed uh, mostly in Korea. So I was given 30 days to wrap up my fares, et cetera, et cetera, and they put me on a train to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And we were trained, uh, this time I was about 26 years old. I was getting fat, smoking too much, drinking too much, and uh, out of shape. And we started getting trained by these 18, 19 year old paratroopers at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And they just about killed us, double timing here, double timing there, doing push ups and everything else. Well, they got us into shape with that. It, uh, it was uh, just about killed us. Matter of fact, it got so bad I quit smoking. Wow. <laughs>
So did you have to go through the whole same basic training all over? Yeah, but it was very quickly. It was 30 days. So oh, just re. Days basic training? That's all. Well, we have. We're all veterans anyway. We all had it before, but we had to get the in in the new. Uh, well, the recoilless rifle, which I didn't operate, because uh, I was still a basic rifleman. So what did you use? Rifle, M1 Garand. Was that the same one that you'd used in one? That's right, yeah. So that was familiar to you. Yeah. After your 30-day basic training, where did you go? Right to San Francisco in the boat. <laughs> that was the quickest operation we had. And from San Francisco, you went over to Korea? Yeah, Pusan. Remember landing, what it was like? Yeah, it was, uh, as you know, it was cold and it was raining. And uh, we were put into a replacements camp uh, on the side of a hill outside of Pusan. And uh, we were given new clothes, new uh, fatigues and uh, a new pair of boots because our boots were uh, they weren't uh, combat boots and uh, we were given a, a sort of winter jacket and uh, a, a bandolier of uh, ammunition and cartridge belt and canteen and all the other things so they got us geared up pretty well for combat Combat yeah, right. Uh, I think uh, a week later I was assigned to the 3rd Infantry Division. Now, <coughs> the 3rd Infantry Division was a, uh, it's an old line division dating back to World War I. It was also called the Rocket of Marne. And um, the, uh, but it all had young kids, young draftees in it that never experienced uh, uh, combat. And we were we were veterans of World War II and we went through a war. And we were put in charge of these kids. And they didn't know enough to duck. Uh, a lot of them got their heads blown off because they, uh, they weren't trained. They were quickly trained, but then sent over there as cannon fodder. And we were sent over there to shape them up. Uh, the problem we had, I was a corporal at that time, they made me a, uh, a a platoon leader. Now, why would they make a corporal a platoon leader? Number one, I had experience of combat in World War One, uh, World War Two, and there was no second lieutenants who were, normally would be platoon leaders. For this reason, the graduating West Point class of 1949-1950 were wiped out in Korea all young second lieutenants, uh, the trained platoon leaders. Why? And I've, I saw it happen. They were all gung-ho. They'd stand up and they'd say, follow me. As soon as they did that, they get mowed down. Now, the more experienced people like myself and others, they say, the hell with that, you know? Duck and shoot, and then duck again, then shoot again. Never mind standing up and being a hero, because you're going to get killed. So uh, wait until you get a good target in sight. So we brought a leveling influence to the youngsters in the platoon. And as uh, soon as they saw that, uh, realized that we were, uh, as, as squad leaders, platoon leaders, that we were concerned about their welfare, we didn't want to lose them because they leave a hole in the, in the uh, platoon. And uh, our job was to hold at that time. And we didn't want to lose our men through heroics. So uh, that was our job to straighten it up. Did you lose any of your men in your unit? No, when I was a staff sergeant, I did. Uh, when you were a platoon leader, when you went over, did you go over with any guys like from your reserves? Was it all guys you knew from World no. War II or all new guys? All new, all. We were in the unorganized, inactive reserves. In other words, we're a pool of cannon fodder. So that's that's what we were. We weren't in any 
reserve units and anything else. They're all individuals. What were living conditions like in Korea? Terrible. Um, World War II? Well, we didn't have the bugs and everything else in Korea, but uh, uh, we were either retreating or advancing. So you never set up any permanent uh, facilities. Uh, so once again, you're sleeping outside in the ground? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and one of the troubles there in the, in the winter of 1950, we were there with summer sleeping bags, summer clothes, summer boots, no gloves, no, summer, no winter hats, and we were freezing. And it wasn't until about two months later uh, up a, around a place called Young Dung Po, and we got a shipment of winter sleeping bags. And believe me, that's the first time I had a good night's sleep when I got the winter sleeping bag. They're, they're quilted bags, though. And we got the heavier uh, uniforms and boots and gloves. But uh, Korea was, uh, uh, was uh, we weren't prepared for it. How did your experiences in Korea differ from your World War II experience? Well, <laughs> you're being shot at, so it's, it's all the same thing. Uh, uh, you either shoot them or they'll shoot you. Uh, uh, it didn't. It was, it was. It was war. It was. It was same war. thing, different place. That's that's right. Yeah. Different yeah. Conditions and different terrain. How did the terrain differ in Korea than in New Guinea? Oh, there's mountains and uh, cold mountains in Korea. Uh, I gotta say one thing though. Uh, I was with the third division, which is a good combat division. Uh, I got a, a, a message when I was up on the line to report back to uh, company headquarters. I did. Company first sergeant, he said, you're to report to the battalion headquarters. I said, what for? I don't know. I reported the battalion headquarters to a, a major. And uh, he said, well, you got to report to regimental headquarters. And he didn't know why. Uh, regiment, they said, report to division headquarters. Man, you must have been in big trouble. I know. I didn't know what, what, what did I do? What did I steal, you know? But uh, I got down to division headquarters, and I, and I, division sergeant major uh, had my records there. And he says, uh, I understand you were a reporter, a newspaper man. And I said, yeah. He said, what are you doing carrying a rifle? I said, they gave it me, and I had to go. He says, uh, the general wants to see it. I said, the general? I said, you know, I'm just a lowly sergeant. He said, oh, no, we're going we're gonna to talk to you. So I, they took me into an old schoolhouse that was, was blown down and uh, took me in a room, and there, behind the desk was a, a guy with two big stars on his head. It was a general Sewell, S-O-U-E-L. And he looked, he said, young man, he says, uh, I understand you're a reporter. I said, yes, sir. He says, uh, you like this division? I said, yes, sir. And he says, uh, you, uh, you got anything uh, to say about this division? No, sir. Everything was sir, you know. Uh, he said, do you know why you're here? I said, no, sir. I'd like to know, sir. Uh -huh. He said, well, I'll tell you. We got the Marines on our flank. And all I see in the daily newspapers, state newspapers, the Marines did this, the Marines did that, and we're doing more than they do. I want you to run uh, a, a public information operation and report on what the 3rd Infantry Division is doing. And let's, let's show the American public that the 3rd Infantry Division is doing this part in Korea. In other words, you know, he said, there's one thing about these damn Marines. He said, they got one of them fighting, another writing, and the other rotating. <coughs> your, your thing is still on.
Sorry, you were telling me, so you're at regiment, or division headquarters, and they're going to have you write an article about... Okay, what I did, uh, now I got carte blanche from a major general to do what I wanted to do as a staff sergeant. So he gave me a jeep, he gave me a driver, he gave me a tent, he gave me a uh, ability to go to Tokyo or have somebody go to Tokyo to get primarily booze, liquor, and uh, bring it back and set up a press tent for the civilian press, Associated Press and Chicago Tribune and New York Times and whatever. So I set up a press tent and I also had good food shipped in canned food, caviar, and uh, I passed the word around to the civilian correspondents over there that the 3rd Division press tent has got good booze, no cheap stuff, good food, no cheap stuff, plus we got cots with air mattresses on them and blankets, and uh, they started coming in. Then I would say, you want to go out on a mission? Uh, I said, yeah. So we had at that time was the 555th Heavy Tank Battalion. And we had the new Patton tanks with the 90 millimeter cannon on it. And that uh, was a five-man crew. One of the front uh, crew members was a, was a machine gunner. And we could take him out of the thing and put a civilian correspondent in there. And of course, he looked through the periscope and see what's happening over there. So we started, I started saying, We'll send you on a, uh, along with a mission with the tanks. So uh, they went in there, of course, after they got, you know, got shot at and got mortared and everything else. They came back and they wrote a hell of a story on it, see? It's the biggest thing. I'm on a tank attack on Phil so-and-so and, -so and everything. And uh, so we started getting good publicity because they say a tank from the 3rd Infantry Division. And um, then... Um, the, 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 uh, the general called me in, or he didn't call me, he called me up, but he left a message for me. He says, I want to yeah, let you know that I'm very happy with your progress of your work and the, uh, the ability to get my name and the division in the newspapers. And uh, I says, okay, he says, keep it up. So I did. So I had a, every, every week on, uh, used to have a fat cat flight, C-47 from Sewell Air Base and in uh, Okinpo Air Base in uh, Korea to Tokyo or Yokohama. And this is an airplane where the high, high ranking people would, you know, put in fresh meat, fresh milk, fresh eggs. And I could take so many cubic feet of that aircraft for was marked supplies, 3rd Infantry Division. And uh, I had our representative over in Tokyo buy the liquor, buy the food. And as a matter of fact, they used to, used to accuse me of, of running a booze and broads operation. <laughs> the only thing I didn't supply was prostitutes. And, <laughs> but it worked. And it got to a point now, I, uh, then I got some extra help uh, from the states, uh, these young kids that went to journalism school. And uh, they told me to train them. The major says, these are your people. Train them. So they did pretty well. They're young kids. And at that time, I was you know, up in the 20s. And they thought I was an old man. And uh, so I got more and more publicity with these young kids going out, all gone home, writing this and writing that, interviewing, 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 and everything else. And uh, we got more and more space in the paper and uh, of course the general recognized that and uh, I used to do the massive press releases and we used to have our daily KIA, WIA, MIA, killed in action, wounded in action, missing in action and uh, I used to take the killed, those that we killed, it'd be, uh, ch primarily Chinese at that time and uh, we killed uh, a thousand Chinese yesterday. Uh, we wounded 500 others. And um, I put these press releases out, you know, how well the 3rd Infantry Division is doing, knocking all these enemies down and everything else. 
Uh, one time, one guy came up to me, he says, Bill, you know what you're doing? You're killing more of the enemy on paper than we're killing in the field. <laughs> so, <laughs> which, which was true, yeah, which was true. This is what the general wanted. And uh, we killed one, I said 10. Killed 10, 20. So, but that's my job, that's what he wanted me to do, and I was a good soldier, I obeyed orders. <laughs> I want to tell you one thing, uh, just before I was going to leave, uh, when the war, Pimmel and John conferences were being held, I was going to be sent back to the States. He gave me a bronze star for meritorious service. So. I guess he did appreciate what you did. How long did you do this new job? Oh. A, y a year? Of course. Did you actually write any of the stories, or did you just manage the whole tent? I put the finishing touches on all the stories. <laughs> what was your title then? What did they call you? What did they call me? Uh, Sergeant. When did you get made staff sergeant? Last I knew you were corporal. Oh, that's World War II, when I, uh, when I got over into the 3rd Division. They immediately yeah. promoted you to staff sergeant? Yeah. What did be, being a staff sergeant get you that a corporal didn't? What's that? What, what were the benefits of being a staff sergeant? You must have more pay? <laughs> yeah, that's about all. Responsibility? Or just do the same job? Uh, well, no matter what rank you had, you were told to do a job, you did it. Uh, primarily, you get more pay, and uh, theoretically, you'd supervise more men, but uh, in my case, no. And actually, once you went to, uh, to do the, the newspaper, how many men did you have under you? Just the guys working on the reporting? I had, uh, maximum, I had uh, five. I had, well, four and one driver. Because the, the, the general gave me a Jeep and a driver, so, you know. Good signature. Were your living conditions better also? Uh, you bet than being in the line? Of course. Where did you stay when you were now the... I had my own tent. Oh, your very own? Sure, I had my own Korean manservant. <laughs> yeah, a Korean woman was washing my clothes. And was your food better too? Absolutely. How did he find out that you were a newspaper man? I guess he was getting fed up with not getting publicity. So he told somebody in the division headquarters, go through the records of these reservists coming over here. See, see if you can find any advertising men or newspaper men or uh, public relations men and so I can use them. So they went through the records, and my name popped up. Said, oh yeah, he was uh, went to Suffolk University and uh, College of Journalism, and he worked on this paper, that paper, and uh, that's that's how it happened. And then you were sent back home. Do you remember when the when you got your orders to go back to the United States? Uh, no, but I. Uh, I, I came back in December of uh, 51. When did you arrive back into San Francisco? Yep. And where did you go from there? To uh, back in the same train ride, Fort Devens, Massachusetts, into Boston. And then were you discharged or were you still in the reserve? I was released to inactive service. See, when I was in the, in, in, uh, I served three years in reserves, but before the three years was up, I was recalled to active duty. And when I was on active duty, the U.S. Congress extended my service for another three years. So, who didn't know it, but that's what happened. And then how long were you on inactive service? Oh, until about 1953, I guess. 
you have any duties or responsibilities? None. And then you were officially discharged in 1953? I was released from uh, a reserve status to civilian status. What did you do when you came back from Korea and you were on inactive service? Did you go back to the paper in Cape Cod? I, uh, I went, uh, I was still wearing my uniform there because, you know, I was six foot three and I took a 39 XL and they didn't have it. So I got to my father's car and I went down looking for jobs uh, in bigger newspapers. And I started the Bridgeport Post and then I went to New Haven Register and uh, the Meriden Journal, Record Journal. That was about three o'clock in the afternoon. I met Carter White, the publisher. And he says, okay, fill out the application. I'll see what I can do. And uh, then at five o'clock, I stopped in Hartford. And the last place on my list was the Hartford Times, which was supposed to be the biggest paper. And it was at that time. So I went into the building City editor, city editor was gone, managing editor was gone. Uh, they're all gone. And uh, I went to see some assistant. And he said, well, they won't be back until tomorrow. And I said, well, who's doing the hiring fire? Oh, nobody. So I walked down the hall and I saw a sign that says, publisher's office, do not enter. So I said, out of hell with it. I walked in. And I said, private, do not enter. So I opened the door and walked in. This, this man looked up and he says, who are you? I says, I'm uh, so Bill Hubner from Boston. I'm a newspaper man. I'm coming back from Korea. I still have a uniform on. And uh, I'm looking for a job. And he says, oh, oh, is that right? He says, well, sit down, young man. We'll talk about it. And he interviewed me uh, verbally, no, nothing in writing. And he says, all right, give me your telephone number where you can be reached in, in, in Watertown, Mass. So he says, I'll let you know. So uh, Monday morning, my mother says, you got a call from somebody in Hartford? I said, okay, who is this? It was this Mr. Murphy, Francis S. Murphy, who was publisher of the Hartford Times. And he says, young man, can you get down here? He called everybody young man. He said, young man, can you get down here this afternoon? I want to talk to you. And I said, yes, sir. So I borrowed a set of clothes. It didn't fit me very well. And I drove down to, to Hartford. I went to Mr. Murphy's office. And he says, sit down, young man. And I said, yes, sir. And he says, uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hire you. And I said, oh, well, thank you, sir. Uh, he said, I don't even know your credentials. He said, but I'm hiring you for this reason. He said, I've got a, a, a secretary here, an assistant secretary. I've got an assistant to the publisher to keep people like you out of my office. He said, but that's what I want in a newspaper, man. Somebody that doesn't obey these signs and goes around and gets the story. And you did just that. You came right to me, asked for a job, flat out. He says, that's what I want in a newspaper, man. You're hired. Report to so-and-so. And that's so I spent 25 years with the Hartford Times. Wow. What were your duties there? Oh, uh, I was a, re a reporter. I covered a lot of things. I covered police. I covered the legislature, general assignment. I was at one time, I was a senior state reporter covering the bureaus around the state. And I ended up as uh, the real estate and development editor for the Sunday Times. And then I knew the, the paper was going down a tube, so I had my retirement in. So I quit. And uh, in the meantime, I was hired by the Connecticut Road Builders Association as uh, director of public affairs. And I stayed there 18 years. Now, when you got your job at um, Hartford Times, you must have moved to Connecticut at that point? Yes. And is that when you moved to Avon? 
No, I moved to Windsor Locks. And I lived in Windsor Locks. Uh, Mr. Murphy was, uh, although he's the publisher of the Hartford Times, he's also chairman of the State Aeronautics Commission. And one of his babies was development of Bradley Airport at that time. And he said, I want you to live in Windsor Locks. I want you to uh, cover that airport. Every, everything about the airport, because it's eventually going to be a big international airport. That's a long time ago. That man had a uh, foresight. So I moved in Windsor Locks in a furnished room. And uh, eventually bought a house in Windsor Locks. And uh, I covered the airport and uh, covered aviation. I eventually became aviation writer for the Times. And, uh, but he was a good man. Francis S. Murphy was a good man. Wow. Did you stay in touch with any of your fellow soldiers or officers from Korea? Yes, one was Major John Danzenbaker, who was a battalion executive who theoretically was my supervisor, but <coughs> he didn't do much supervising because everything was going so fine. You know, he was getting credit, too. So we became good friends. And he lived up in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Uh, he's dead now, but uh, he was a good man. And, uh, uh, oh, oh, I forget his name now. He, he, was an editor, he ended up as editor of the Greenwood and Mississippi Times, a newspaper down there. Uh, another one was uh, Oakland, California Tribune. Uh, so, we're all spread around. Did you join any veterans organizations? I belonged to VFW. And what's the post number? Uh, 3272 uh, uh, Avon. When did you join the VFW? Actually, I joined them in 19- Oh, 15 years ago. <coughs> what are the activities that your VFW post engages in? Oh, well, they have the Voice of Democracy contest for the school children, and uh, they field uh, speakers on, on uh, World War II and Korea and Vietnam uh, to the high schools. Uh, they, junior high schools, and I was part of that, uh, telling the youngsters what the, the military is all about, and uh, you know, other sundry things, you know. We, uh, if anybody dies, we have a funeral for them, fire a rifle. And you retired from the Connecticut Road Builders Association? Yes. So you've been retired since and living in Avon? Yes. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? Oh, yes. How? Oh, I smartened up, that's all. Uh, you need a good, strong military because uh, uh, we were caught off guard in Pearl Harbor without a strong military, and we were caught off guard in Korea without a strong military. So I've always been a strong supporter of uh, military appropriation. And uh, that's one reason I worked on Ronald Reagan's campaign, two, two campaigns, because of his, uh, his uh, budget to uh, uh, improve the military, get new equipment, new aircraft, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I worked on two of his campaigns, raising funds. Do you attend any reunions? Of what? military reunions, either from World War II or uh, I belong to the Society for the Third Infantry Division. I haven't attended any reunions. How did your service and experiences affect your life? Well, the old story, you went into the Army as a boy and you come out a man. About the size of it. So you'd agree with that? Yeah. You think that you helped save a lot of the young men who were inexperienced in Korea because of your experience? That's true. Uh, the, what you said is true, but you got to remember, I was there to save my own family, 
And in doing so, I saved theirs because uh, to smarten them up, because I had to be smartened up by some of my uh, platoon sergeants in World War II. Have you been down to Washington, D.C. to see the Korean Memorial? No. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't covered in this interview? No, I guess you've done pretty well. It's, uh, uh, Any other stories, incidents that you can remember either about World War II or Korea? There's a lot, but I don't want to go on record with it. <laughs> okay. Anything else that you'd like to add? No, not at this time. Well, I'd like to thank you, Bill, for supporting this project, and thank you for your time. Okay. Sure.